Good morning. <laughs> On behalf of the faculty at Mercer University and those at the McAfee School of Theology, let me thank you for the warm welcome this morning and the invitation to come and to be with you today and to share with you in worship here at the First Baptist Church of Williams. I have to say that my arrival today uh, marks several firsts for me in my ministry. Uh, this is indeed the first time I will have preached in Central Time, so I thank you for that opportunity. Uh, it is also the first time I will have ever preached in the state of Alabama, so I do appreciate that because I heard the state of Alabama has a lot of wild turkeys, and I'm a wild turkey kind of guy. So uh, I turned in off Nisbet, and there were six gobblers standing in a field, and I thought, I have come to the right place. <laughs> and this is the first time I've ever driven two hours in a tropical storm to be at church. <laughs> so I do thank you for the invitation to be with you this morning and to share with you in worship. And to also acknowledge your long history of support and nurture of those who have come to the McAfee School of Theology at Mercer for all these many years of our life together. It's exciting to see that you send us students like Nikki and Michael and the Fords and others who have come to McAfee and studied and found their way into the gospel ministry of our Lord Jesus. And so thank you for those many years of support and continued support. Uh, the gospel lesson this morning comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. The 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, the 15th verse and following. 14, 15 and following. Jesus says to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you, and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, and after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, and you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. May God bless this, the reading and the hearing of his holy word. The days of Jesus' ministry, as we all know, were concluding. It was the time of his passion, as we call it. It was Passover, and he was in the city of Jerusalem to do his Father's will. And in the context of Jesus making his way on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and finding himself there, doing his Father's will, sharing with his disciples those things that were to come, in that context, in that cauldron, shall we say, of strain and emotion, Jesus shares very directly with his disciples. And in doing so, he says to them, I command. And in those commands, he sets the context for the life of those who will be his followers 
long beyond his crucifixion and resurrection. That is to say that Jesus speaks to his disciples and in speaking to them, part of the character of what he says is in the form of a command. And he reminds them of the nature of that command and in so doing reminds them of how it is that he and we relate to him. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you are the people whom I've gathered, then you will keep my commandments. If you're the ones who are going to take my name, then you will keep my commandments. And so the commands of Jesus, those things which Jesus has commanded his disciples, his followers, in a very deep sense, almost define us as Christians. Mark us as the people of God. Serve as indicators of where one might find the church of Jesus. So I suspect it's pretty important for us to kind of get in on what Jesus means when he commands us to do anything. And that's the funny thing about it, isn't it? That's the odd bit about it. Because when Jesus commands his disciples, he's not terribly ambiguous. Now I know that there are many occasions where Jesus addresses his disciples and the kinds of things he said to them lead one open to well, shall we say, multiple interpretations, particularly in parables and, and such stories that one has to pick from them what it is he might be saying, but other occasions he just tells it straight. And that's precisely the problem. If there were more ambiguity, if there were more wiggle room, if there were more ways in which to contemplate Jesus' words and find oneself weaving and bobbing and feeling oneself okay, then, well, fine. But the truth is, is that he said so many things that seemed fairly obvious. Now, there's this thing going on all around us. That thing that I'm referring to is that there is a rather radical shift taking place in what we call the wider culture. Uh, Pew researchers who have given some time and attention to the question of religious observance have noted that over the last decade there has been a rather steady, if not somewhat dramatic, downturn. in the numbers of people who live their lives according to what we might call religious observance. You know, going to church and all. Joining the choir and all. Doing the kind of things that seem so customary for so long are no longer so customary. And it's particularly evident among the young, those whom we call millennials. In fact, their religiosity is so remarkably low that it has caused many researchers to be rather surprised at the gap between the religiosity of young people in America today and those of a generation that are older. And so for young people, that kind of religiosity is only running around 27, 30% at best. 
And when you inquire with young people, what's going on? What's the matter? What is it that's keeping you away? Why aren't you engaged in the same way those before you were? There's frustration. For a lot of our young people, there's a frustration that there seems to be a gap for them, according to their testimony, according to the research. There seems to be a gap between the words of Jesus that seem rather straightforward and the life of the church. For them, at least, things don't add up quite as well as they might. Now, when these researchers have measured young people's spirituality, the irony is, is that their spiritual lives, that is their belief in God and their inclination to pray and their desire to have a life shaped by what it is God would want of them, that all seems to be intact. It's just the church going part that seems to get, be getting weak. It's just the religious stuff that all of us have for so long been so important. There seems to be some kind of tension there. And so as I have reflected on these challenges, I have drawn a few conclusions. And I think part of it begins with the kind of struggle all of us have with what Jesus has told us to do. See, if we go back to when Jesus started telling his disciples what they ought to do, and we look at places like the Sermon on the Mount, and when we hear from Jesus that there's a certain way that those who would listen to him, would behave. These are the kinds of crazy things that he said. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it was said you shall love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I don't know about you. But that's tough. That's hard enough to hear. Much less do. That's hard to replicate. That's hard to be. That's hard to become. That's hard to even make sense of. But the challenge, at least from my perspective, is Jesus is the one who said it. Now, when I was growing up, it was customary for my father to make certain requests of me. Now, that's a joke. My father never requested. He told me to do this or that. And in the telling, guess what? There was no ambiguity. There was no, put it in seminary terms, hermeneutical confusion. There was no interpretive gap. And so if my father's words to me about something as simple of, as fixing the brakes, the front brakes on the car, 
are fairly straightforward and unambiguous, how much more so might the words of the one who brought everything into being also be rather straightforward? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Well, have you ever been persecuted? If you have, you know how far away you are from those words. If you've ever been betrayed, particularly by someone you love, you know how far you are from those words. If you've ever had someone that lived next door and just kept putting their trash can in your driveway, you know how far you are from those words. We struggle to love our neighbors, much less our enemies. And unless I've landed on a different planet, I suspect you do too. And so here are Jesus' words to us, and he is unambiguous. And yet we live our lives with those words imprinted on our hearts and minds, and yet we find ourselves so removed. So here's the thing. We're a clever lot. And we've come up with some ways to explain what Jesus must have meant. I told you there wasn't a gap, but I think we found one. You see, what we tend to want to say about Jesus' words, that if he has set for us an ideal. Here are Jesus' ideals for our lives, and we try to live up to what it is that Jesus ask us to do. It's something to strive for. It's a goal. It's an ideal. It's somewhere we hope to arrive someday. And if we work at it bit by bit with each other's help, we will find our way to that place. And we will fulfill those things which Jesus has commanded of us. But it's in its essence an ideal. It's just a goal. Do you really think Jesus was setting goals for us? For our personal achievement? Is that what all that came to? Is that what the week of his passion meant? Did he die on a cross and raised on the third day for us to have a goal setting session? Well, maybe that one doesn't work so well, but that's one of them. Well, again, to introduce a big, fat theological term, we have decided in some cases that if it's not a goal, maybe, maybe these words are eschatological. That is, maybe Jesus' words aren't meant as a goal. They're meant to represent, to paint a picture for us of how things will ultimately be. In the kingdom. When the kingdom fully comes, when he comes back, this is how it's going to look. You'll have people who once hated their enemies loving their enemies. So, what we have is not so much something to strive for, but something we can hope for. We're all going to get together and hope for another, another world, a new kingdom, things being otherwise. And so what we're really about when we contend with Jesus' commands is recognizing that it's all about hope. Really. Again, Jesus is just sharing with his disciples what they can hope for. Don't forget, these are the people who are going to form the church. They are going to be the embodiment of the church. They are meant to be the body of Christ in the world. And it's just something to hope for. These things Jesus commands. And lastly, maybe they're not there is a 
kind of goal-setting exercise. And maybe it's not just something off in the distance that maybe someday we'll all experience. Maybe they're meant to be prescriptive in that they make a certain demand on us. And in looking at them or hearing them or experiencing them, they serve as a kind of mirror so we can look at our own lives and recognize our sin. And by recognizing our sin, we will turn to the grace of God and be redeemed. Makes a kind of sense. But in all three cases, in a, in a way... If he didn't mean it, I don't think he would have said it the way he did. My father never asked me to go replace the brake shoes on the front of the car as a mirror or as an eschatological hope or as a goal-setting project. What in the world are we to do? And if that all wasn't enough, if that all wasn't difficult enough, Jesus goes on to say to those who would become the embodiment of the early church, you remember... Be ye perfect. As our Father in heaven is perfect. What? There was a time in my own. <laughs> where the Lord spoke very straightforwardly to me. This is also the first time I've ever preached in the dark. <laughs> but I'm going to keep going. There was a time in my life where I went through a period of difficulty so extreme that it felt like my corpuscles hurt. Does that make sense? It, it, it wasn't physical pain. It was, it was more emotional pain. Somebody that meant more than life itself to me had been harmed by someone else whom I loved. Now just imagine having someone you love more than your own life harmed by someone else that you love. So not only do you have the pain of one whom you love being harmed, you also have the pain of the one whom you love harming them. And these words of Jesus about loving your neighbor Maybe, but loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you, you got to be on drugs to think that's going to work right now. Can you get there that quick? Can you? I couldn't. I couldn't get there. And I was in a bad way, let me tell you. And I saw something a year or two after those events that had a remarkable and profound impact on me. You remember when all those church folks suffered like they did when that young man came up and shot up their Sunday school class in Charleston. And it wasn't too many days later that there were voices out of that church coming and saying that they forgive the young man who shot up their loved ones and their families. I marveled at the grace that possessed these people. I marveled at their capacity 
over a relatively short period of time to get to where they could at least utter the words of forgiveness. And as I thought about how in the world did they get there, I thought to myself, well, it appears that these folks have been praying in this direction a long time about a lot of things. In other words, they've been bearing up in a certain way for a long time. And, it's, and the reason it comes so quick is the way they've been bearing up. And I was reminded of a, a verse from the Apostle Paul where he, he talks about our sharing one another's burdens. Do you remember that verse? What does that verse say? It says, share one another's burdens. And, and why do we share them? In order that the law of Christ might be fulfilled. Well, for me, that was a revelation. Share one another's burdens that the law of Christ might be fulfilled. Here all this time I had thought that the commands of Jesus were first and foremost sitting on my shoulders. That what it was that Christ required of me sat first and foremost on my shoulders. For my head and for my heart alone only to recognize perhaps for the first time that when Jesus talks to his disciples, he's not saying, hey, you and you and you over there and you in the back, this is what I command. He was speaking to everybody. He was speaking to the whole. He was speaking to y'all. He was speaking to the church. Or to put it another way, the principal moral agent of the New Testament is not me or you or you or you. It's us. When Jesus utters a command, it's not to the individual, it's to the church first. When he says you, it's in the plural. You love your enemies and pray. For those who persecute you. And it was as if someone <laughs> had turned on the lights. Sometimes you or you can't carry what life has brought. Sometimes you can't get to that part of the praying, just like that. Sometimes you may not be where you can give not just your shirt, but your coat also. You may be where if somebody smacks you on one side of your face, you can get to where you can turn your head and wait for the next one. But the church can We can do it for each other. We can bear the burden one with another. Which means that when I was going through that tough time, even though I couldn't pray for my enemies, my whole church could, and they did. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you're carrying. What I do know is that when Jesus spoke to his disciples, he spoke to the church. And I know that he commanded them to live in a certain way that reflected the grace of Almighty God. And I also know that in that church there are plenty of folks, probably every person, in one way or another who can't get there. But if they can't carry one kind of pail, they can carry another one. And we don't carry any of them for ourselves. We carry them for each other. And we discover in the course of time that even though we're weak, the church, through God's grace, is strong. 
and that this church and any church can be and should be a place where the rest of the world sees and experiences and understands the real depth and breadth of that grace. So that no matter what angle you encounter the church, there's somebody there to carry some of what you have and help you get to where you need to be. For too long we have thought that our relationship to God, that our spiritual lives were singular and direct and utterly vertical. We relate to God and then we relate to everybody else. Well, friends, God has called the church to be his moral agent, to be the one who acts on his behalf. And we, as sinners, find our way by that grace through receiving from one another the gift of sharing those burdens. And so I invite you, I invite you as God's people, be attentive to one another. Hear from one another. Share one another's burdens so that the commands of Almighty God are realized in this place. You may not be able to get there by yourself, but you're not supposed to. You get there by God's grace, one with another. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. When the world sees that, there's no stopping the church. When young adults see that, They feel like God and this place are the same thing. That's who we are. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your love and your mercy which you have poured out on us through the cross of your son Jesus. We thank you that through him we have received your love and heard from him of the life and gift of grace that you've given each of us. But Lord, you have also made a refuge of grace your church. That each of us, though we may not ever any one of us measure up to all that you have called us to do and become. Your church stands ready to live out the gospel, bear one another's burdens, and find our way to the truth to which you have called us. Lord, continue to bless and work in these people, for they are indeed yours. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.